Listen, mate, I'm really sorry, but I still can't get this right. Who are you again? Jeremy, you stood here in your corduroys, um, but I'm going to tell you one final time. Teo Gagan Hart. Don't forget, you're listening to La Course on Terre. Hello and welcome to La Course on Tech podcast as always. We welcome Peloton subscribers and Aerogram listeners. I'm OJ Borge, still slightly muddy. This is after two showers, after deciding that as a storm ravished where I live today was the day I started my 2020 cycle across training regime. Just me to get home and find the season had been cancelled. Up yours, COVID. Alongside me is the king of the corduroy and writer of Bad Blood, which, as we all know, is the Taylor Swift international pop smash hit, Jeremy Whittle. Hello, Jeremy. Thank you very much. How yeah. are you? Yeah, all right. Thank you very much. Good. And you've, you've been set right on how to pronounce the name, haven't you? Yeah, very much so. Yeah, which I appreciated really because, you know, after years and years struggling with it, to have him, you know, looking into my face kind of very def- definitively pronouncing his own name, that was good. So it's cleared up now. It's all yeah. cleared up. It's, it's all problem, good. Yeah, the only problem is you've actually changed the way I say his name and now I can't get out of saying Gok and Hart. But anyway, I'll try over the rest of this podcast uh, uh, also alongside him virtually is peter cossins who is wearing what peter cossins are you wearing corduroy i'm not i am wearing corduroy actually <laughs> you're very good in it as well as we're doing this over a zoom call uh pack show this week with initial reactions to the 2021 tour de france route the latest mountain showdown in the vuelta on the mind bending leg snapping vomit inducing angler climb plus we grab a quick coffee with the newly crowned giro champion as now pronounced by Jeremy Whittle. It is? Teo Gagan Hart. There we go. Um, Jeremy, you told me to call this a Super Sunday. Can we call what we've just seen as a Super Sunday with only one bike race happening? Yeah, but I think there was so much of the stuff crammed in, you know, it was all, and it was all kind of peak time viewing as well. The Tour de France launch happened in Sunday in France, kind of at the peak hour of the, of the evening TV schedules. It's normally on a kind of Thursday evening in Paris about 11 o'clock in the morning. So <clears throat> everything has you know, been thrown up in the air because of everything that's happened this year. So now we get the most legendary climb in Spanish cycling at the same, almost the, the same time, or as a, almost as a precursor to the 2021 Tour de France route. So yeah, I think you can definitely call it a Super Sunday. Oh, Jeremy, did you just say that the most legendary stage in all of Spanish cycling was merely an amuse-bouche to the announcement of the 2021 Tour de France route? Well, I think the Tour de France... Trumps everything else, doesn't it? Ooh, okay. Peter? Oh, I, th- I think it's pretty dismissive to just to say it was the Anglia who's a tapper compared to the for, for the Twitter France launch. But uh... how many dining analogies are we going to go for with this? I don't know, because I'm full already. And with that, um, before we go any further, let's slake our thirst for cycling news by retiring to the back room of the Smoky Members Club and the Leather Club Chair of News. It's the FOB. Well, I'm back in the club lounge chair, but there's a difference. I've given up G&T, so it's a healthy fruit cocktail for me. Moving rapidly on, this week felt almost routine compared to most of the rest of the 2020 season. I'll talk about the tour route later, so quick resume. Lots of Brittany, twice at Levante in one day, and more time trials than a recent date. In terms of who's going to be there, it's looking like, as well as the 18 World Tour teams, Arkea and Applause, Alpecin Phoenix, Matthew Vanderpool will make it as the top two squads this year in the pro team rankings. Also looking forward to next year, there's no tour down under we heard on Sunday. That's depressing but sadly inevitable in the current circumstances. Otherwise, it's all been about the Vuelta. An entertaining duel building between Richard Carapaz and Primoz Roglic, who've swapped the lead four times now. Having lost it last Sunday, Roglic regained the red jersey on Friday in, drumroll, controversial circumstances, as the ugly and arcane question of what is or isn't an uphill finished reared its head. Suffice it to say that Ineos, for one, weren't happy with the way the judges ruled over the time gaps, and there was a protest on Saturday morning, which didn't achieve a great deal, to be honest. This wasn't the only controversy, of course, with Sam Bennett relegated from the win on Thursday for using his head in the sprint. I don't mean he overthought it. Finally, we came to the Angleroo on Sunday, with Carapaz taking the jersey back from Roglic and Hugh Carthy landing the biggest win of his career. By the way, hats off to EF for, for renewing all contracts with riders who took a pay cut this season. That team, for one, has had a great post-lockdown season, but I guess we can't really call it a post-lockdown season anymore. It's more. It's become more of a happy space between one set of lockdowns and another set of lockdowns. As for who, which rider will be in the happy space next Sunday in Madrid, this one is simply not possible to call. 
Thank you very much there to William Fotheringham. Um, let's start then. Let's turn it into a starter itself. Let's start with the Tour de France route announcement because 2020, I think we can all say that it's been an experience. So let's write it off and look to next year as we metaphorically head to Paris and catch up with the highlights of the 2021 Tour route and the initial reaction in France. Peter, did you watch the announcement live? Was it everything? Because I didn't watch it live and it was live streamed. Was it everything we hoped for and more? It was, uh, it was much more... I wouldn't say it was more low key. It was very different to how it normally is. I mean, normally you're just sitting in this auditorium in the middle of Paris with 3,000 other people, mayors from all over France, obviously loads of riders there, loads of dignitaries, past tour winners. Um, you get Jean Etienne Armory, who's, who's the kind of the, the CEO of uh, ASO, the organization that runs the tour. He makes a, a, a long and quite dull speech. So we didn't get that tonight. We just basically got Christian Prudhomme saying, this is it, and kind of zipping us, zipping us around France with his, with his graphics and uh, laying out this very interesting tour route, I'd say. Now, I've, I've, I'll get this in early. I tweeted it out. Apparently, somebody had done it before me, although I did send it to Jeremy initially. And it works better as a written joke than it does actually me saying it. But Jeremy, Von too. Yeah, it works better as a written joke than you actually saying it. Definitely, yes. <laughs> But no, no. So that one of the one of the highlights of the route. I mean, I think I think it's quite a classic Tour de France. It's kind of got, you know, stages in Brittany with the crosswinds and the rain. You probably get rain and squalls coming off the Atlantic and all that kind of stuff. It's got uh, time trials heading towards the kind of centre of France, the breadbasket bit of France, where you know you get kind of long rolling flat days, and then long rolling and flat days, and then you go right across to the Jura, the Alps, and then down to this showpiece stage, which feels like, it does feel like a bit like the centerpiece, certainly the TV centerpiece of the race, which is the double ascent of Mont Ventoux, which hasn't been on the tour route for a few years. It's always been a, a kind of traumatic ascent for lots of reasons, most famously because of Tom Simpson dying there in 1967. But it's but there's always drama on the Ventoux, and I don't think this year will be any different. So they, they you know, one ascent is normally enough to send the sprinters scurrying for cover two ascents will probably have them you know kicking cats this evening i'd imagine um pete pete should take us through the pyrenees because obviously you live in the pyrenees pete and uh the pyrenees are kind of well if 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 the von Sous, i'm not gonna say mise en bouche and it's not even a plat is it it's a bit but the but the pyrenees are certainly certainly the 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 meat and potatoes of the um of the tour route yeah it's definitely the main course i mean uh, like you say i live in the pyrenees and i'm it looks like there's, a, there's seven stages basically that either come into the Pyrenees or five within and then one that goes out at the end. So, I mean, it, it really is centered on the Pyrenees next year. A third of the race will be, will be in that, in the range. And I mean, the, the stages are a good mix as well. I mean, there are, there are lots of new climbs in there. Um, there's a, a very interesting stage to into Andorra that goes over the uh, the Baixalis Pass in Andorra, which is which is very very steep, near the finish. Also over the Onvalera, which is over twenty four hundred meters high. So that will be the roof of the tour. Um, then we get uh, we're going back to the Col de Porte, which we last saw in two thousand and eighteen, when Nairo Quintana went up there um, above San San Larry Soulon. That's preceded uh, by kind of if if you think back to the two thousand and eighteen. Uh, stage it was that mini stage where they had the kind of the, the gridded start they went over the Paris sword the the, the Col d'Azé and then they went up to the Col de Porte after that and also we've got a, a, a short stage but an interesting one over the Tourmalet and then up to Lusard Den which uh, which I'm really looking forward to because it's a, an absolutely beautiful climb and uh, and I rode it last week so uh, it was quite nice that it turned up on the tour route. Did you did you were you just doing that because you knew ahead that it was going to be on the Tour de France? You wanted to lay down a Strava time just to make sure people <laughs> had something to try train for. I, I did. I, there were rumours in the in the Pyrenean press that it was going to appear, so I thought um, I'd give it a go. But uh, it, it's so beautiful up there. I mean, when you get towards the the hairpins at the top, which are really spectacular, it's a real natural arena up there. The, the, these huge banks that make amazing grandstands. I mean, assuming. That people will be allowed up there um, next July and, and can watch the tour again. Wow. It's a really fantastic setting for, who, for a bike race. Who knows who's going to be allowed to do what by this time next year? Uh, more time trialing. Uh, 2020, what we had 36 kilometers. This year's 58 kilometers over two TTs. Most since 2013. The penultimate stage before the showpiece into Paris is a TT as well. Jeremy, 
why are they put more time trialing back in? Is that because this year was so exciting? Well, it's very odd, isn't it? Because I wrote I, 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 earlier this year, I wrote a piece lamenting the lack of time trials in major in major stage races because in grand tours over the past kind of 10, 15 years or so, they've dwindled more and more. And I think that was kind of obviously we've now had the two two grand tours we've already had this year, the tour and the Giro decided on the final day in time trials. So maybe maybe there's a, a resurgence in the popularity of time trialing. I think they're not they're not regarded as TV friendly. They're regarded as kind of being boring, I suppose. I mean, you know, the last day of the tour and the last day of the Giro were the opposite of boring. They were they were they were really gripping. Okay, the Giro was a bit of a foregone conclusion, perhaps, but in but the tour certainly wasn't. And that was the kind of most gobsmacking finale I think most people have seen to a stage race for for years. So. It's interesting. I, I like the look of the, the the final time trial, which is on the penultimate day, the final Saturday, from Le Bourne to Saint Emilion, which is kind of in the heart of the very best French wine country, I'd say, really, pretty much. Beautiful roads. Saint Emilion is this kind of little hill town, um, so I'm sure that'll be spectacular. It's also, I think, been somewhere where the tour has been kind of, or the, the winners either really hammered it home with a significant win. I mean, it looks to me like it's kind of, you know, this route is no good for anyone like Roman Bardé or Thibaut Pino or anybody who kind of has any Achilles heel in terms of the time trial, uh, even if they're a fantastic climber and can get some time. So you'd, you'd think it's a kind of, I mean, it's very Rog, Roglic friendly, Dumoulin friendly, Thomas friendly perhaps as well, Pete, do you think? Yeah, and Pogacar, obviously, very friendly to Pogacar, but I mean, any route's friendly to him by the look of it. Mm. Uh, I guess the highlight of all of it is going to be these, as you said, Jeremy, it's these two, a sense of Mont Ventoux. You've written a book about Mont Ventoux. I know you've lived in the area as well. You posited this as an idea when you were asked by, I think, one of the <laughs> French papers, didn't you, of what you would put on your dream your dream tour route and you actually suggested this so they finally have listened to you jeremy well i know i mean i'm, I'm expecting a check in the post any time but no I, I think what 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 happened was it's they did a double ascent of alp duez i think about six years ago now does um, it work a double sure. ascent of something i mean does it i mean or well, does it, is it just so hard that no one attacks i think that's an interesting point because i think you know what you're going to see on the von two is you're going to see no attacks the first time I'd imagine there'll be a break and there'll be a break that will go early and it will, you know, they'll go over the top. And then when they come back down again, it will all happen on the second climb. Wouldn't you think Pete? And then there'll just be this, there'll be attacks in the last three or four K to the summit on the second time up from the bit from the big, big names. And then a scramble over the top and then a mad kind of breakneck uh, run down into Malasen at the bottom because it's a long descent and it's very, very fast in places. 100 kilometers an hour um, in the past uh, has been kind of a kind of a normal top speed going down. So, you know, I, th I think it may look great. And that's one of the things about the Vontu. It always looks stunning. But whether it will really change the shape of the race that much, it won't decide the outcome. No, unless somebody decides to run up it, which is, I think, the last time anyone went up Vontu. It's when Chris Froome was knocked off his bike or he crashed his bike and decided to jog halfway up, of which I'm still in awe of, because if you've ever tried to even walk, in a pair of cycling shoes is not impossible, let alone running in them. Uphill. Yeah, uphill as well. You could make it as a, as a, as a triathlete. Um, the one thing the neither of you have mentioned, yeah. <laughs> one thing neither of you mentioned, which, and tell me if I'm wrong here, but looking at the route, the way it goes, um, it's a good one to drive if you're a journalist because there's no large transfers until the final one. And even that's not long as you get back to Paris. That is long, that is long. It is long, but, it, but there's no map that doesn't see. Okay, is it a good one to drive if you're a journalist? Will there even be journalists there next year? Oh God, yeah. I mean, always. I, uh, I mean, it may be another distance to experience as as both myself and Pete had this year, where we were kind of you know at arms, literally at arms length the whole time, and we weren't at arms length. We were in a in a sports centre five miles away from the finish line and doing it all remotely. Um, but I, I'm really optimistic that next year. I mean, one of the things somebody I you know obviously have been. Uh, in a frenzy on Twitter about the Vontu reappearing um, this evening. But at the same time, somebody messaged me and said, and said oh, it'll be hell on the Vontu with all the crowds up there. And I was thinking, well, ho let's hope so, because, yeah. you know, th these mountain climbs without big crowds on them, they're eerie, aren't they? And I mean, we've seen that in the Vuelta particularly. They're cinematic. You know, they're kind of, there's, some, they're a bit, there's a bit, it's a bit mournful, I think, when you see a really grand climb and there's kind of, you know, the wind blowing and it's kind of slightly autumnal and there's, 
you know, a couple of gendarmes standing there huddling against the true, trees, you know. true. But it's amazing. By and I don't know if you either of you back me up on this. Maybe Pete. I've got used to it now. Watching the Vuelta, I haven't, I haven't even expected cli- expected crowds to be on there, and I think it has made the television directors become more creative with the way they film the race because obviously they have to show different things in different ways. And we saw it with the World Championships and that beautiful shot where they were riding across the the, the back of that climb and they sort of got the foreground, the background. So I have actually forgotten that crowds should be there and I've enjoyed the Vuelta with crowds or without crowds. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you, OJ. I think one of the things that struck me, I mean, I, I don't watch a lot of uh, watch a lot of football, but I watched two of the rugby games yesterday, the final, final games in the Six Nations and particularly the France Island game at the Stade de France, just with... I mean, essentially, probably 200 people in the stadium, and it just wasn't a spectacle at all. I mean, it was a, it was a, it was a great game. I mean, there wasn't any lack of excitement, but it just didn't really generate any atmosphere. But I find watching the cycling that um, because of the, I mean, because the terrain so much a part of it, you're still you're still able to get all that. And what I found interesting is particularly watching the Anglerou stage today was that because the bike is kind of in the rider's face the whole time, that um, you're able to see much more of what's going on. There aren't people getting in the way. You're able to see the effort. I mean, the Angleroo today just looked absolutely gruesome for all of them. I mean, you could see the agony they were all in. And normally you kind of miss so much of that because you're not seeing it kind of really in close up and in, in kind of slow-mo as they, because they were going so slowly today. Well, you've, segued, they're, they're, you've, you've, you've segued beautifully onto the onto the uh, the Vuelta. I want to get onto it in just a second, but just just one thing on the tour announcement for next year, Jeremy and Pete. Are you expecting it to be a classic Tour de France with that route? It's really difficult, really difficult to tell, isn't it? I mean, I thought this year's tour was quite flat in places, and then it suddenly burst into life intermittently until you had that totally unexpected denouement on the final Saturday, which really blew everyone away. It's really hard to tell looking at the route. It, I, I, th- I kind of think, you know, you do this every year, you analyse the route and say, oh, they've included this stage and that stage. And, you know, the biggest stage might be a crosswind stage to, to Carcassonne. You know, that, that could be the stage where the race is won or lost or, or you know, it could be into Andorra. It could be on the one too. But sometimes it's just random things you can't expect. I mean, you know, a rolling water bottle, a rolling bidon down a Sicilian street changed the shape of Tao Teo. Gekin's hearts. <laughs> I, I had to Gokken. think. Then. Did you really just go for Teo Gokin's heart? Because that is. I, I had to think. I had to think. I hope he's not listening. I had to think then for a minute. I think it's, uh, it's become like, it's become like a kind of you know a nervous tick. Now. All right. But anyway, all right. Inst- so, instead of is it a classic route? Does it excite you? Yes or no? Yeah, I think it does because uh, yeah because there's enough in there. There's enough in there to and I it's this thing, isn't it? You know, is it a test match or do you want it to be? A 2020 game and 2020 me, game. I, I want 21 2020 games. That's what. Well, I want. yeah. Well, but I want I want a test match. Okay. Well, hopefully we can have both. Are you excited by it, Peter? I am because of seven stages in the Pyrenees, and I might get to sleep in my own bed two or three nights. So. <laughs> <laughs> always thinking problem. of yourself. Always thinking of yourself. <laughs> um, right. We we half moved on to the other side of the Pyrenees, uh, which we had stage 12 that completed today atop of the Angrelou, uh, won by Hugh Carthy of EF Education. I'll give you a quote now. Uh, this is from somebody who's well respected in the cycling world. It was like voyeurism, sadomasochism, dressed up as cycling. That was on an email chain today from Peter Cossins. Um, is it the most brutal climb in all of cycling? Is it the Angrelou? I mean, because they were going so slowly. It was like it was like a load of oh, I don't know glaciers crashing into each other and overtaking each other. It's, it's interesting. I was looking at they they compared the. Um, I saw some stats comparing the Angleroo to uh, to the Mortarola, which I mean, in terms of gradient distance, they're almost exactly the same. And I mean, having been up them both, uh, I haven't ridden up the Angleroo. I've driven up it, but I've, I've ridden up the Mortarola. The difference for me is that the Mortarola is kind of for for twelve and a half kilometres. It's kind of consistently brutal. It's consistently 12, 13, 14 percent. After a while, you kind of do f- get into well almost a rhythm i guess but the angler is just just crazy i mean you, you at the bottom it's 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 kind of it's quite steep then you get into a middle section where you actually start going downhill at one point you're on a plateau it's not very long but and then you you reach this kind of upper part of the climb and it's just insane when you get up there i mean 23 24 percent i mean I, I was i was there the last time the the, the weren't there in 2017 
and uh, when Contador won at the top and there were people like burning their clutches out going up there. I mean, it, it really is a ridiculous climb. And I mean, like I, like I was saying before about just being able to see the effort that the riders were making because the cameras are getting in so close. It did feel like, uh, I'm going to put, put earlier, it was a bit like watching the Hunger Games or something. You could see these guys kind of slogging themselves almost to, to their physical limits. I felt like almost, it, 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 I shouldn't have been watching it somehow. It was, it was, it was so brutal. Did you, it's like a, a cycling snuff movie. Did you see, um, did you see there's a clip online, I'll, I'll, I'll retweet it later, of just Froome kind of halfway up, I think it's about halfway up, uh, with Dylan Van, Van Baal alongside him in a small group. And they're moving slowly and he's really crushing the pedals trying to keep going. And I mean, it's, it's compared to the Froome that we know from the past, you know, uh, his, from his kind of, his glory days, you know, it's, it's a very different, he looks very different now. So uh, I think it's, it's a, I, I've never been there. Um, I really want to go because, you know, it's become mythical now. It really has become a mythical climb, much more, much more fearsome even than the Von 2 and some of the other really legendary climbs as well. And it just seems to be beyond cruel, doesn't it? Yeah, so. it, it had everything today, this stage 12 did. It had a change in the leader as well. Primus Roglic, who was dropped going up the climb. Um, lost out to Richard Carapaz, who beat him. But the person who actually won the stage, as I mentioned, was Hugh Carthy uh, of EF Pro Cycling. And it was for a young rider, Peter. It, it was quite the performance. And it, and it sort of came out of nowhere after he attacked a couple of days ago and then lost a few seconds. Then he lost more seconds yesterday. It came out of nowhere. It was a brilliant attack. And he held on to go over the top. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was interesting watching. I mean, when they got onto the steepest, I don't know, five or six kilometres towards the end, and uh, Jumbo Visma seemed in complete control. They still had three guys with Roglic and Roglic didn't seem to be struggling. And then um, I can't remember who it was who, who made an acceleration now, but uh, there was, there was a, oh, it was- oh, It was Enric Mas, Enric Mas. Enric Mas made his acceleration and that kind of scattered all the, all the Jumbo guys and it just left Roglic and with set course for company. And, uh, but before that, you'd seen, it looked like Carapaz was in trouble. It looked like Hugh Carthy was in trouble. It looked like Enric Mass was in trouble. I mean, they were all kind of down the back of this group of eight, eight to 10 riders and that looked like they were going to get dropped and Roglic was just going to ride away. And clearly they just managed to judge their effort a bit better than Roglic did, or maybe they were just on a better day. But Carthy looked like uh, he was really, he was, he was just going to fall apart at one point. And then he, he made this burst and, and, and he, I mean, like they, they were moving in slow motion and he, he didn't really go away that quickly, but it was enough to, to give him like, uh, I don't know, maybe 50 or 80 meters advantage. And on the, on the Yangle route, that's a massive advantage. I mean, it, it, was, it was a good gap. And then there's this little dip at the, bot, at the top where they, they go down and they descend for like half a kilometer into the finish. And he'd obviously opened up a gap of like 10 or 15 seconds, but just coming up to the, the top, just before he reached that descent, his face was contorted in the kind of agony I don't think I've ever seen. I mean, it just looked like, I mean, it was gruesome to watch. I mean, you could see, he was just like tearing <laughs> himself to, apart to get to the top of that climb. I mean, it was... It was after ridiculous. so many so years working in cycling, Peter, I never would have had you as a shrinking violet when it came to the brutality of the sport and these climbs. I think, I, I think, like I was saying, it's, it's that interesting thing of, of, of being able to see so clearly what's going on. I mean, you could see, I mean, someone like Dan Martin is, you can see the pain in his face a lot. But with some of the other guys, it's maybe, maybe a bit more hidden. But because they've got the cameras right in front of them, you can see so much clearly what's going on. But it also tells you, doesn't it? It tells you just how steep that climb is and just, just how brutal it is for them. Because, you know, these, these are the, the very, very best world very best cyclist in the world and the and Hugh Carthy is among the very best climbers amongst the very best cyclists in the world so if he's pulling that kind of face you know literally turning himself inside out then it just reveals so much about how hard it is and I think I think you know you you tend to think oh it's they're only putting a face because it's like doing the Beck Hill climb or something like that you know something something in Surrey or the south of England and and in fact you know it's it's just a whole different ball game completely different ball game completely different level of suffering, the length of suffering as well, and the length of endurance. And I mean, that's one of those things that whenever people judge cycling for whatever reasons, ethical reasons, other reasons, 
you have to stay that from a position of understanding just how brutal it is. Um, did you see the text that uh, Jonathan Vorters, the EF education boss, put out after he'd won? Did you see it? I haven't seen that yet, no. OK, um, I tried to use a computer. You know when you type something in and get the computer to speak it for you? I tried to get the computer to do it, uh, and it didn't work for a couple of reasons. And also, had I even downloaded it, I would have had to have paid for it, and I didn't want to do that. So I shall, I shall attempt to do it. This is the text. Oof. Then there's nine explanation marks. Then, and then there's got to be at least 20 explanation marks. And it keeps on going like that and ends, I think, with another 15 explanation marks. You could probably say that he was pretty excited. The thing is, they keep winning, don't they? Mike mm -hmm. Woods won, won the other day. You know, they won stages in the tour. They won stages in the Giro. They won, they've won stages in the Vuelta now. They're, they're, they're kind of really on a roll. Uh, and it's also all the riders that he's kind of touted in the past, you know, like the Danny Martinez, Sergio Higuita, Guerrero, now Carthy as well. That, uh, and Mike, I mean, Mike, Mike, Mike Woods is moving on, but, you know, it's, it's great for them that he's moving on on such a high um, because he's, that was a great stage win he achieved the other day as well. So, so they just kind of keep churning these stage wins out and they're all really good stage wins. They're not kind of, you know, a fairly lame stage with a lame break. They're really prestigious, big stages, aren't they, Pete? Yeah, I mean, they're, thinking back, I mean, yeah, I mean, Danny Martin is his stage at the uh, at the tour. That was the one to uh, the top of the Puy, uh, Guerrero, yeah, Puy Marie, yeah. And uh, I mean, obviously, uh, Guerrero did did he hold on and win the the, the mountains jersey at the at the Giro? I think he did. He, he did, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, I mean, yeah, they're, they're, they're doing extremely well. And, and remembering, of course, that they're, they're one of the, the teams with the lowest budget in the World Tour. To keep to, to win stages at all three Grand Tours this season is quite phenomenal. And have all that extra press because of the shirts as well. They've been, they've been very clever this year. They are, would you say they're having the best year of all the cycling teams? No. No, no, I wouldn't because of, <laughs> no, 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 okay, no. No, I think, I think you'd have to look at Ineos. Uh, at the moment and say that, you know, despite the disaster at the tour, they've kind of bounced back so spectacularly at the Giro. And now, you know, Carapaz, I don't know, Carapaz looks pretty good to me. I, I don't know if the, if the smart money would be on him or Roglic, but it's well, pretty let's, close. Let's talk smart money then, because it's set up beautifully as we head into this second rest day of the, not just the final Grand Tour of the year, the end of the cycling season. We've got a week left of it. Uh, Richard Carapaz wearing red, he's leading. Uh, Primoz Roglic just 10 seconds back and it was just the 10 seconds that he lost today which I think Pete you watched the stage as well as I did considering how he looked like he'd blown up a 10 second loss was pretty good yeah I thought he was going to lose a lot more than that I mean I, I was expecting it to be at one time it, it got up to about 15 or 18 seconds and and somehow he managed to claw it back I mean I think with uh, Set Kuss kind of dragging him along that obviously helped mm. but uh, I mean look, looking just ahead I mean they've got the day after the rest day, they've got a time trial, which I expect Roglic will 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 not only win, but he'll 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 get like two minutes on on some of his nearest rivals, like Dan Martin. Uh, I'm not sure about Carapaz. I mean, he's he's kind of decent, can do a decent time trial. So can Hugh Carthy actually. So it would be interesting to see how that plays out. But I mean, Roglic is still the favourite to win. I think. I mean, he's not going to come up a climb against a climb like that again. And if he can hold himself together over the next few days, he's still my favourite. But that's what we said at the end of the Tour de France. That's what we said at the end of the Tour de France. Uh, Hugh Carthy, <laughs> after today, after the win and also the bonus seconds, is 32 seconds down. Uh, Dan Martin in four, 35 seconds down. And Enric Mas is one minute 50 down. Uh, Jeremy, so would you agree then? I mean, is it, is it just Primus Roglic over the course of the final week? Is there smart money to be placed elsewhere if you were a betting person? I think Carapaz has, has ridden a great Vuelta and, you know, we know, we know what a kind of um, attacking rider he can be when he won the Giro. We, we, we saw the way he can, there was an element of surprise in the way he won the Giro. I think, I mean, he hasn't got that on his side anymore because obviously people know who he is now and he has this reputation and uh, Palmares, you know, he's got his results in the bag and everything. So, so we'll see, but at the same time, uh, Who's got the strongest team? It, it could prove to be this, again, another Ineos Jumbo showdown because it might come down to that. And there's still, there's still, I mean, the Vuelta 
is so notorious for kind of people throwing bombs in and you know exploding the race whether it's at the expense of Chris Froome or Alberto Contador did it, did, well, he did it to a few people didn't he Pete in, over the years he's he's sprung surprises on a few people um, to secure stage wins or overall wins so I think there's still a lot of racing left and Roglic if he relies on the, on the final time trial that might be a mistake so he, he'll certainly need to watch every watch everybody around him I think because it's very close does Enric Mass still have a chance? 150 down. I think so. I mean, I think any of, any of those five guys have got a chance. And one other thing that we'll, we'll have to watch is that they go up to, uh, to La Covertia in on the penultimate day, which he, I think is best part of 2,000 metres high. And, I mean, that's still a few days away yet. I mean, if the weather turns bad, it's, it's probably people are going to struggle. I mean, we saw Roglic struggling the other day when it got cold. And maybe, maybe that will be the thing that will turn it against him. Yeah, and also, as, as has been said by a few people, no one's riding defensively anymore because you've got so many young riders who want to animate the race. You've got people riding for contracts. You've got people, you know, with Primoz Roglic, you've got a score to settle. I mean, no one, you can't see anyone over this final week of the season, this truncated, strange 2020 season, who will ride defensively. I, I think I think any one of the top five can, can win. I think for them all to be under two minutes and for them to be under 35 seconds, it's just set up beautifully. Well, there's there's some worrying stats going around, aren't there, about about you know the number of riders who are out of contracts and riders who are worrying about their contracts, and it's it's quite significant numbers of the peloton who are still uncertain about their futures and who you know have obviously have anxieties about what's going to happen next year. I mean, when you talk to guys who have got contracts sorted and they've kind of looking two or three years ahead, they're pretty they're pretty happy, they're pretty relieved, and it's no longer it's not about the kind of the value of the contracts, it's just the security. I think that um. Increased, increasingly riders, riders are looking for because you know it's, it has become I mean just looking at it now to, apparently um, there's a tweet going around which I think is pretty accurate 291 riders are out of contract at the end of, uh, are out of contract at the end of this year 65% of them that's 151 are still officially out of contract as the season ends wow it, so you know there's a lot of riders in the market and obviously it's a shrinking marketplace so there's going to be some people who aren't going to be there's going to be some people riding the Vuelta who aren't going to be pro bike riders next season which is a horrifying thought horrible thought horrible horrible thought well let's head from Spain to the trendy area of Soho in London and if we're talking about hipster coffee shops for cyclists there are no more that are hipster than Bar Italia of which I as a, as a self-confessed attempted hipster I do actually own a Bar Italia cycling show Jeremy what is the background to Bar Italia why is it so famous within cycling to cycling circles in London I think it's more it's famous within sport because it's just kind of the venerated Italian kind of coffee bar with four mica tops and 50 stools it's a tiny little place it's a it's a tiny little kind of it's a cupboard really but it's, it's right in the heart of Soho in London. It's probably, I'm not saying it's got the best kind of coffee, but it's the most authentic Italian bar in London. And it was, it's been there for like 50, 60 years. But it kind of achieved a, I think Mark Cavendish had a, had a launch there once uh, or a press conference, I mean, which must have been, you know, there must have been people hanging off the rafters, I would have thought. Um, and then um, there's pictures of Bradley Wiggins in there uh, make, making coffee, I think, as well. And they've got various pictures on the wall of kind of uh, uh, faster coffee and people like that as well. And they always, you can go in there if, 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 if the Giro is on or if Italian football, Serie A Italian football is on or any big bike race, you can, or any big sports event, basically, any big European sports event, anyway, you, you can go in there and they've, they've got it's on live, you know, on Italian TV and, uh, loud loud and proud so it's 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 a great place so we went we went i went in there with uh teo and uh he had his uh, magna rosa with him he's only magna rosa he's only got one because um he's, he's, he said he's expecting a suitcase them, but they haven't turned up yet so he's only got one and uh i, I was expecting a more kind of exuberant reaction from the italians in there but they were like oh okay <laughs> <laughs> campione, 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 and then they just shrugged and kind of served served him an espresso. So, well, uh, whose idea was it to go very, there? Mine was it. I knew it would have been your idea to go there. Um, well, let's hear. Sorry, but I was expecting I was expecting a more joyful reaction, that perhaps than than um, than we got. But anyway, I think there. it was fun. Now, this is part of a longer conversation with the new owner of the Magli Rosa, which you can read about on the Course on Tech website. First question, Jeremy asked him was about that moment he saw Geraint Thomas crash. I've never I've never experienced that before because he's 
crashed in the neutral. Yeah. And right next to Ronan and I, we were, most of the team were together. And yeah, we could stop for five, six minutes. Yeah. So it was weird. It was very weird. He was quite was clearly in a lot of pain, pain yeah. immediately. Um, and we had no idea how it had happened. It was only kind of late at that stage. I sp- one of the riders in Quick Step told me that they'd seen him hit a bottle and we kind of guessed it must be something like that because we were on cobblestones at the time which we encountered a lot in Sicily and uh, yeah and then for me I because re- we obviously started on such a high with that prologue not only Filippo but also Geraint had basically put time into everyone and mm. quite significant time into a lot of guys like over a minute which we'd never imagined was going to happen mm. and then uh, the down and, and it was really quite down and and you know the next day was a sprint stage so we couldn't really stage four was 100% demar going to win there was no way to put the pass behind us because we just had to be patient but for, for, for you mentally you kept it together didn't you on Etna I mean you, you didn't kind of like yeah it was did, definitely did, did, the worst you, it was definitely the worst performance of my not not mentally I think of my three it was 100% um, be, because actually I felt really 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 good and then I just didn't eat anything, I think, at least for the last... Normally, I'm really good with my nutrition. I never have issues with it. And I didn't eat anything for like the last hour and a half of the race. Yeah. Significant. But you must have been quite thrown when you buy everything. Oh, I think on. in hindsight, yeah, yeah, yeah. in the moment, I was like, okay, come on. you just got to focus. This is an opportunity for you now. Of course, thinking about G, but I think also us knowing that he'd, you know, at least got back on his bike was a big first step to hopefully him continuing the race at the minimum and it wasn't like he was battling it was kind of like clear night and day he said no there's, you know, I can't can't pedal with one of my legs so so when you're in that situation are you kind of like part, part of you is like looking over your shoulder waiting or did, no did swift, you just get... swift so we were with G the whole time yeah. we rode I think the impre- I'm going to cover this up sorry mate That's the right. impressive thing was that um, bad, yeah. no yeah of course don't give End any publicity. I just didn't spend an inordinate amount of money on a pair of trainers. Um, we she rode super well. We <laughs> rode super well as a team that day. Yeah. Um, because we didn't speak about it, we just focused on the job in hand. We stayed exactly on the plan we had. Right. And basically, the only deviation was when 50k to go, Swifty. I'm less 30k to go Swifty come on the radio said Teo ride your own race I'm with G I'll stay with G the other two guys that were in the front at that point stayed with me so you made the decision no no the, no, no, no. It they came, told came me. from the car uh, it came from the car to an extent but it was a really chaotic stage so Swifty actually yeah. also the radios aren't what a lot of people would be led to believe in terms of well, effect, effective when I've been in team cars I've got that impression that they're not always so I think t- I'm I'm pretty sure Tosho said the same thing, and then yeah. Ben Ben kind of reaffirmed it, um, which was also quite significant because he's the closest person to to Geraint. So the right. fact that he okay. said it was like okay. n- there was no debate, you know. He just said done. Yeah. So Castro and Salva stayed with me in the front. But you were halfway up Etna when that happens. No, 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 no. no. We were before, about ten k before. before the bottom of Etna. Well, still. But it had been a super chaotic final. We had very similar to kind of the road that G got taken out on there was a lot of for some reason slightly downhill fast cobbled streets through little yeah, yeah. Sicilian villages yeah. um, and it was pretty chaotic to be yeah. fair it was a hot it, I think it was like the last hour hour and a half was the, one of the more if not most intense of, of the whole Giro okay. so G was super unlucky that the freak crash then was per, per, not proceeded. Um, I can't think of the word. Po- po- post something. Yeah. Uh, Followed up by. Su- succeeded. Succeeded. Yeah. Succeeded by. Yeah. What was one of the harder days of the race, really? Did you see what he said the other day about being quite hard for him to watch you win? It was the same for me last year, and I broke my collarbone. Okay. I didn't watch anything. I came back to London. Um, so you you weren't like kind of like uh, at all sort of like. <clears throat> That's no, and, that is and, and last year in the Giro, we went in with Egan as a leader. The week before, Egan broke his collarbone. Yeah. And Pavel and I got the call saying, "Yeah, guys, you know, 
basically in absence of anyone else, mm. you're got, you you boys are going to get the opportunity. I was we had both come off tour of Alps where we were flying both yeah. of us. I remember, yeah. Um, and I was feeling the. I remember the day that it all started to go really peak time. I was riding along, thinking, "Wow, this is the best I've ever felt in a world tour race." I mean, you can't ever compare cycling to juniors and under twenty threes because it's, you know, if you feel quite good now, that's already a really good sign. Yeah. Or well, the best sign is if you don't notice how hard it is and other people are getting dropped. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, you're good. Um, it's not like there's anyone that's riding along thinking this is easy or anything no, no but I just no. felt amazing and then I had a pretty bad crash from the road just being in Italy you get those like big weird bumps where the road's cracked because of roots and stuff under Yeah. so I was overtaking someone obviously they'd all avoided it because they could see it and as I pulled out I just hit this bump and just launched into outer space um, spent a week licking my wounds and feeling awful stage 13 um finally felt better and Nico was you know rightly just telling me be patient there's so much of the race to come mm. don't worry about it mm. in my young and kind of eager to you know show myself and prove people wrong and all the rest of it I went in the in the breakaway which Zacharin won from that breakaway so it wasn't like it was a, a stupid move but I broke my collarbone on, on the second descent of the day so then sat at home here, had surgery in, in Manchester, didn't watch a single stage of the Giro. Yeah. And, pa- and I was super happy for Pavel because yeah. he, I think he finished eight or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he did great. He was yeah. in the best young rider for a few days. Like He had a great race, but it was nothing about him. It was just like, you know, I didn't, I didn't have the energy to, to absorb but, any of that. But when that moment happened on Eta, did it feel like kind of carpe diem? You know, that, that kind of... This is, my um, this is my moment from here on now. No, I think there's not any. No, no, not there's at no all. Kind of there's no big significant Rubicon moment. No, no, I, it's just literally a case of thinking. Well, I need to do the best I can and uh, reassess when when we get to the bus and yeah. and take it from there. I think. Yeah. Do you know who Magrini is? No. So Magrini is like the the only like as far as I'm aware anyway, like, famous Italian cycling commentator. On TV? That's everything. Okay. He's on Eurosport now. Or, so he's yeah, on... It must be Rai, actually. He's Rai. Yeah. And does he write for, like, a Zeta as well, then? Maybe. Yeah. Don't know. He come up with this nickname about two years ago. Actually, that's giving him too much credit. He didn't come up with anything. He just called me Guganga on Italian TV. And I started hearing it at races... It's just him trying to pre- pronounce my surname. There's nothing else to it. <laughs> oh, right. There's no, yeah. there's no ulterior motive to it. It's no, no, no. Well, everybody, everybody <laughs> does. I mean, it, it comes off the... In the if you were Italian and you shouted that or at least <laughs> excitedly announced it, you'd, you'd, uh, you'd get the ring to it. Yeah, it, it Guganga. Guganga. With a real emphasis on, on the... <laughs> well, in Italy, it's getting there, yeah. Uh, yeah, sense. yeah, yeah. And it, at first, I was... Not really sure on it to be honest, but it's only grown on me because this bloke's like got a serious amount of energy. This commentator, right. and like my Italian Swanya played me a clip of him the other day, kind of like just saying it over and over and over because he feels like ownership for it. It's is like that, his... is that online somewhere? Probably. Yeah. I'm it's sure just, you could find it. Bad. They're a worse one, don't they? I mean, yeah. it's not great to be fair, but. Um, <laughs> It's not really a nickname even, I don't know what it is, it's just like, it's turned into like the Italian way that you say my name, essentially. But I suppose they need something that's a bit, that has a... Relatable. Like, it, yeah. yeah, and also that has a like, uh, exciting, like um, a vowel at the end, like, you know, like, uh, Pantani, or, yeah, you know, yeah. so something that goes up at the yeah, end. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've got Nibali, the, you know. You've got the Wig, Wigo, and something. then you've got the... Squalo. You don't hear, yeah, squat, yeah. you don't hear Vincenzo no, or no, Nibali no. on the ro- in the ro- in the race. You yeah, hear so says that. Yeah, yeah. It's only. Actually, what, the was most... he, what was he like with you? Was he gracious with you? He's or? always been. Yeah, yeah. Because mm. last, I I didn't know him at all at all until uh, Alps last year. We went hammer and two for three, four days. Oh, so the Alps, yeah, yeah. And then I got to know, and then we both 
did the, in hindsight, not the smartest thing of racing the age like a day later. So we were chatting in the age about how, because we, Salva and I had had to sprint for some flight like an hour after I'd been on the podium in the finish of Trentino. And uh, so I was asking him how and he'd driven and whatever. It was, that was the first time I spoke to him. Do, do you um, speak English or Italian or mix, just mix it? Yeah, like, I don't speak Italian, but with my Spanish, I can understand okay. a lot of Italian. Yeah. More or less, what's yeah. the gist of everything. Yeah. Um, so he's, his English is actually quite good. Nah, cause I, I tried, but he doesn't. He doesn't. He, you won't. You won't. No, he doesn't like. Yeah, using no, it, no. Because no. I tried. I've tried a couple of times to get him to say things for recordings and stuff. Yeah, like yeah. That. No, no. no, no. The interesting thing in the Giro that I enjoyed was um, how unbelievable amount, and it got more and more during the race throughout the entire country. We heard the words Ghana, um, yeah. and kind of thinking about that, and actually the fact that. Okay, he become an incredible star in Italy in the space of two weeks. Mm. Do you think younger guys? It's something I've been questioning. Like for the older guys, do you think it was harder to adapt to all that change? Because if you've been like a pro for fifteen years, or even longer, some of them in a rhythm. Yeah, yeah. And it's like this total predictable ritual, so. ritualistic. I think the opposite. I think, of course, self confidence doesn't come exclusively with age, mm. but as an athlete, I think it's quite intrinsically linked that exactly what you're talking about is years of actually knowing what works what doesn't we still had two months on the road before we raced right it's not like we had as long on the road as we did stuck inside and a lot of guys weren't even stuck inside yeah yeah and i think if you could Sorry. see some more clear link between people that were confined and not confined performing you might be able to thank you go to more of that type of conclusion Mm. that it was to do with the mm. situation but there's I've looked and there's no we've chatted about it within with my teammates with, we've with spoken team, about yeah. it yeah. about like uh, you know is there some you know this group of people like the Scandies that were all riding outside every day or the Dutch are mm. they performing better there's no correlation no, whatsoever no, no. I think for me personally looking back at the lockdown if I'd been even more if I was more experienced than I am, I already didn't do like a ridiculous amount. I, I kind of ticked over rather than. Uh, that's what's quite weak in this. I was going to say that's it's not. Gonna, I thought it was a tea bag in there. Not. Builders, yeah. Um, <coughs> need look, need look. I already was pretty patient, but I could have been even probably another step more patient. Yeah. Um, so I think, in equal measure, for the young guys, it was bizarre because. That, you know, there's the technology side of things, but I can tell you I didn't go on any type of, not to mention one brand, but that type of gaming. Yes. I didn't yeah. do that apart from the three races I did. Would you rather go on the road or was do that? Oh, 100%. Yeah. Well, that's, I never ride inside. Yeah. I ride so inside. even if it's a shit day, you'd rather go out? On the I, would, I would never ride inside. No. I, I, will, I will probably... If it's that bad outside that you can't go outside, I would say at least half the time I'd move my training and take a day off. Right. Hence the fact why, you know, the moment I could move out of England, I did when I was a kid. Theo Gogan Hart there um, with his wife. Has he only got one shirt? Did he bring? The, I take it he didn't bring the trophy with him, did he? No, no. And I think he's got. I think he's got the trophy because he posted a picture on Instagram the other day of him outside a pub, of course, called the Grenadier, which I think is. I think is in Bow. You know, he only took the jersey on the uh, after the final time trial. That was the only time he pulled it on. And with that, we are done. Thank you, as always, for listening. Make sure you check out LaCourseOnTech.com. Tons of writing on there, not just about the Vuelta, but everything that's going on in cycling at the moment. And, of course, the 2021 Tour de France route announcement, which was made earlier on today. Thank you to the King of Corduroy, who is Jeremy. What's your middle name, Jeremy? Uh, Gekin. <laughs> is it Gekin or is it Teo Gekin, oh, you've started me off on this. Thank you to Jeremy Whittle, the King of Corduroy. And also thank you to Peter Cossens as well, uh, who is part of the Pyrenean Press, I now believe. Indeed, yeah, I am indeed, OJ, yeah. Looking forward to the tour coming next year. Oh, yeah. Especially so you can... Actually, if, if we're all on it, can we all stay at your house? 
Yeah, we've got loads of room. Yeah, all come. Everybody's welcome. Exciting. Well, the entirety <laughs> of the press pack, can you imagine it? Uh, thank you to you for listening. Thank you, as always, to our Peloton subscribers and Aerogram listeners. Uh, and we'll see you next week, not just for the end of the Vuelta, but for the end of the 2020 cycling season, which, let's be honest, has been an emotional roller coaster. We'll see you there.